education in citizen science. For me, citizen science in its very essence is innovative. Innovation and citizen science go hand in hand. And they've been able to create a lot of innovative ideas and ways to answer research questions, ways to collect data, such as online tools or apps. But I've also enjoyed the way that it's been innovative in the way that it's enabled different communication channels and the way that the community can engage with the researcher and the researcher can engage with the community alike. But don't just take my word for it. Tonight we have six fantastic speakers who will be presenting this evening. Firstly, we'll have Iela, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sydney, and as well as a science communication researcher. She'll be followed by Michelle, who's the project director for OSMAP at the Total Environmental Centre. We also have Jasmine online, and Jasmine is a research fellow at the University of Adelaide's Environment Institute. And she's bringing some additional guest speakers with her this evening. We have Wendy, who's from the iBandy project, and also Rosalie and Robert from the Wild Orchid Watch project. So as I mentioned, jam-packed session with a lot of fantastic speakers, but that's enough for me. I will pass it over to Yela uh, to take you through the first presentation. Thank you, Yela. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Excellent. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks, Patrick, for organizing this really incredible uh, booking session. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about innovation in citizen science in the Breaking Good project. Um, so as many of us um, probably know, citizen science has grown exponentially over the past um, 10 years or so. And according to Rick Bonney, who is a dominant figure in the citizen science space, this is because of the richness, scope, and value of this expanding field. So that is to say, citizen scientists are involved in so many different activities, um, the different tasks that they are um, uh, taking part in, um, the different ideas and the different issues that citizen science tackles, uh, whether it's science uh, focused, um, issues or human focused issues, uh, whether the science uh, scientific questions are raised by scientists or perhaps by communities. But when we look at the scientific fields that are represented in citizen science, we actually see that there are a few um, fields that are do more dominant in citizen science. So this is some data from a survey um, I conducted um, earlier um, or late last year. And we can see here that in Australia, the majority of the citizen science projects are in ecological projects, so that's different biodiversity uh, projects, environmental sciences, so that's looking at different um, hazards, um, environmental hazards, and biology. Um, and this is not surprising, this is data that we actually really know um, from looking at the citizen science uh, landscape in the global citizen science. Um, and we can see here that the chemistry and physics and public health is really underrepresented. And that is what um, global citizen science, unfortunately, uh, is the case as well. When we think of chemistry in particular, this is even more enhanced. And that's actually quite shocking when you think about it because chemistry is really around us in everything that we do, whether it's in the air that we breathe or in the water that we drink or in the medicines that we all sometimes need to take. And while there are a lot of citizen science projects that are focused on um, uh, air quality and water, uh, water quality monitoring, they're mostly focused um, on their environmental aspects and pollution aspects and not so much on the chemistry aspects. And well, that is why I'm very happy today to present Breaking Good, which is a chemistry-based citizen science project um, that is also involved in public health. Now, Breaking Good was initiated by Associate Professor Alice Motion, who is also joining us today. And also, happy birthday, Alice. Um, Breaking Good uh, empowers members of the public uh, to be active researchers in, pub in projects that improve public health. And today, it has two different aspects. One is a lab-based project in which um, students, university and uh, high school students, engage in lab-based molecule synthesis. And then there's an online project 
which is called Essential Medicines, in which people investigate some of the information on medicines that, and their accessibility. And Reiki's good focuses on increasing accessibility to essential medicines. And essential medicines are defined by the World Health Organization as those medicines that satisfy the priority healthcare needs of the population. And these medicines should be available at all times in adequate amounts and affordable prices, in appropriate dosages and assured quality, and with adequate information. So these are a lot of A's and together we can say that these medicines should be accessible. But unfortunately, there are a lot of barriers to the access to essential medicines. And this can be related to physical distance to people that um, reside in places where they don't have access to public care, to public, to public care. Um, it could be related to the market incentive. That's when there are few patients, uh, but high manufacturing costs. That is also related to price hikes, which are sudden increases in the prices of medicines. Uh, they're often um, due to low profit margins. And indeed, different societal challenges like public and political influences. Now you can see here a picture of a drug called hydroxychloroquine. Now many of you um, might have heard of this um, medicine because it has been in the media re recently. Well, it actually has been around for quite a while and it was first patented in 1955, but it has recently been suggested as a medicine that could treat COVID-19. Now, unfortunately, the science actually says that this is not the case and hydroxychloroquine is not effective in treating COVID. But this has not stopped the huge surge in the sales. And this is problematic because many people rely on hydroxychloroquine uh, to treat uh, different autoimmune conditions. And this could cause a problem in the supply of this medicines to people that actually need it. And so while this is just one example, there are many examples of barriers to access to essential medicines. And the truth is we really don't know the extent of this problem. And I think that maybe is the biggest problem that we have, that there is no transparency and information sharing in regard to the accessibility of essential medicines. And when this is lacking and when there is no mutual learning, then we can really don't have a lot of opportunities to negotiate the distribution of these medicines and the pricing of them. And so that is one thing that we are really interested um, in looking into in Breaking Good. And so as I said, Breaking Good has two different aspects, the lab-based um, project and the online project. And so until recently, break, participating in Breaking Good was limited to schools and to university students. And what they did was engage in molecule synthesis as part of their um, studies of chemistry and in part of their lab instruction, they would conduct, they, or they are conducting synthesis of different molecules, um, both reproducing uh, existing medicines and creation of new molecules for different diseases. And so in the picture up here on the right, you can actually see students from Sydney Grammar School that participated in um, Breaking Good. And they set out to reproduce an anti-parasitic medicine called Daraprim. Now, this medicine was price hiked overnight by hundredfold or more. Um, and these students, after a lot of work and determination, were able to re reproduce this medicine for a fraction of the actual price. And so this is an example for how much people that do, are not scientists and do not have um, the vast scientific qualifications uh, that scientists may have, but they are still able to create an impact and to, um, um, and to um, progress um, th these ideas. But for one problem with the breaking good uh, in the labs is that it's limited to labs. And so people that don't have these fancy facilities or are not university or uh, school students weren't able to participate. And we were looking to expand this to broader audiences. And that is why we initiated uh, the Essential Medicines Project, which is an online project for reviewing and for gathering information on the availability and the costs of essential medicines. So I was talking before about the lack of information sharing. And so with this project, we wanna aggregate 
different sets of information that can be found in different places on the internet or people's knowledge and aggregate them all together to create one unified database where all this information is publicly available. And with that, we hope to break down the barriers, both for the information and in the future for the access to essential medicine. And in addition to creating this database, which will be open for different members of the public, for policy, for research, for researchers, this will also inform our future activities in drug discovery in the lab phase project. So how do you participate in essential medicine? Well, we have a set of challenges uh, where we ask people to provide information about different essential medicines. And there, I don't have time, unfortunately, to describe each of every one of them and exactly how they work. But I will say we're asking people to provide information, either information from their own knowledge or things that they can find online or in different places about these medicines and their accessibility. So I will just talk about the last challenge, the circle of life, which is perhaps the more complex of the three challenges. Because some of these essential medicines have been around for over 50 years. So you can imagine that over this time, a lot of things have happened with these medicines, uh, like changes in prices, changes in ownerships, acquisitions. Uh, so we wanna try and find out all these different life events that happen to these medicines in order to form a bigger picture and to get some meaningful insights into these medicines. So um, I'm gonna show you an example for what we can do with all of this information. So this is the circle of life of a medicine called cycloserin, which is a medicine for the treatment of tuberculosis. Now cycloserin has been around for quite a long time and it's had a lot of different events that happen. And while each event doesn't really tell us a lot, when you aggregate them together, you can actually tell a story of what happened to this um, drug over time and why. And most interestingly for this drug is what you would see in the bottom left in green. And that is a following an acquisition of the rights of this medicine. The price was hiked from $17 to $350, making it unaffordable for a lot of members of the public. Now, interestingly for cycloserin, this was actually intervened by a nonprofit non organization that reacquired the rights for the drug and reduced the price again to an affordable price. So there's a happy ending here, uh, but unfortunately not all medicines have these um, happy endings. So by aggregating all this information, we weren't able to do this without you know, finding the little bits of pieces about this medicine from different places on the internet. Uh, we can actually understand um, which medicines are accessible to who, to what places in the world, um, and then work for the future um, to try and mitigate this and try and uh, make these medicines more accessible. Um, so I'd just like to thank you for listening today and thank all of my colleagues in the SCOPE group in the University of Sydney. Um, and happy to answer any questions.